You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Benazzi from OptionFit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rockin' tune means it's time once again for the Option Block, everyone's favorite bi-weekly source, for all things options related, a little bit of options wit, a little bit of options wisdom, a little bit of options education, throw in a dash of fun, indeed a sprinkle of hilarity, a smattering of some listener questions, and of course, peering ahead into the murky future of the market. Stir it all together, and you have the option block. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Back from my globe trotting to myriad conferences hither and yon, and I'm really excited to be back here in the old studio producing one of my favorite programs, The Option Block. And I'm pleased to say that joining me on the old program today, he had to sit out last week, but now he's back. You know him, you love him, as Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to The Option Block program, sir. Always happy to be here. And I do believe we have the Greasy Meatball joining us. I'm not sure. I think we're playing that Where's Meatball game right now where he's either coming here or in transit or having uh, connection issues at the Option Pit Global HQ. I'm going to lean on the latter. Maybe he didn't pay the Skype bill this month. Either way, we're going to keep on rolling with the show. He'll join us later. It's time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block. Like the name implies, this is indeed the portion of the program where we break down what was moving, what was shaking, what was rocking, what was rolling in today's market activity. End of the day. Pretty much a uh, fairly mild end to the day. Most of the major indices pretty much unched or right thereabouts there on the day. We had a bit of a range, about a seven-handle range in the S&P, but nothing, uh, nothing too crazy, nothing compared to what we've seen certainly in recent weeks with most of the major indices just all over the place, hither and yon throughout the entire session. And of course, with a whole lot of nothing happening in the market today and approaching the beginning of a shortened, truncated holiday week here in the States. Of course, uh, VIX Cash taking a nice exhale, pretty much uh, all roughly unched, but a little bit on the downside as well. And you know, if we're not seeing that little pop post-weekend and everything else, that's pretty much the equivalent of a bit of a sell-off out there anyway. But a lot of interesting things kicking off to catch our eye. But before we do that, Uncle Mike, you had to miss uh, Thursday's show last week, and of course, you're on with us today. So give us a little bit of uh, what caught your eye towards the tail end of last week as well as what's catching your eye in today's activity, sir. Well, we are technically positive on the year again with SPY and on, on the SPX. So, I mean, with that, I've brought in my bullish call spreads uh, as as I had to. Uh, but should we go negative, I will be getting out of them or taking many deltas off the table rather quickly. Uh, not a lot really happening today. Just a couple of stocks that kind of caught my eye a little bit. Nike's up a buck sixty on the day, um, close to two and a half percent. Walmart is actually up a dollar on the day. Uh, so now, granted, Nike does have earnings. Uh, uh, their earnings call is all set for tomorrow, I believe. Uh, and so 
with that, there's really not a whole lot happening this week. I think just everyone is uh, kind of geared up for a shortened week and uh, with Good Friday coming up and uh, Easter Sunday. Yeah, a bit of a shortened week this week. Unfortunately, uh, no uh, no ball views on Friday, listeners, if you're looking forward to that. Of course, uh, the market is closed. Uh, so when the market's closed, kind of hard to parse a lot of, uh, of good options-oriented activity for you guys, even though we do try. You mentioned Nike, Uncle Mike. They are indeed one of the few names uh, that's out there with some, uh, with some earnings on the horizon, earnings pretty much at the tail end of the, of the quarter here of the season. We're looking here. Nike having a decent day today. <laughs> Looks like maybe some, of it, uh, maybe some of it is already leaking into the marketplace. Nike up about 2.5% or about buck sixty-five on the day, closing right around 64, uh, 65 or so uh, on the day. Of course, that 64 half straddle going out right around 380, 390 or so. So they're pricing in nearly a $4 move out here, which is uh, fairly aggressive. Uh, for a name like Nike, I don't know. Do you do you pay attention to that name at all? Is that one of the ones you have in your uh, strategic Knigget folder or portfolio? I should say, Uncle Mike. The strategic Knigget, huh? Uh, you know, that's one where um, within the strategic night, that one has had some exposure in the past. It still is in there, but it's not. I wouldn't call it necessarily a huge position, uh, but definitely is a position. Uh, it's kind of been a long time holding of ours. Uh, but with it, it's one where I'm not writing any options on it or anything like that, just within the uh, the general population with which we're hedging on the broader-based index. Uh, Nike's one of those companies to where it's it's a great brand, and it's like Disney, it's like Walmart, it's like McDonald's. Uh, I'm personally a Nike bigot myself in terms of all my – in my whole football career, I always wanted to wear Nike shoes as best as I could because uh, it, it, it's, it's a good shoe. It's a good product. And so good brands that are combined with good products a lot of times make for good stocks. Well, you know why they're rallying today, of course. It's because they finally cracked that nut of the self-lacing Marty McFly Back to the Future shoe. Did you see that thing? The I did not. Shoes. Yeah, they announced it last week. I guess they've been working on it for 10 years. They were a little bit late. They missed the, uh, the I believe it was last October, uh, the great uh, 30 year Back to the Future anniversary. But uh, still, uh, the self tying shoes are a thing of reality, courtesy of Nike. I think they're coming uh, later this year, I believe. So if you were one of those people who were holding out for that, and clearly, why else would the stock be rallying, right? I mean, that's just uh, why wouldn't you give the stock a couple of points? Just on that's worth a couple of handles, at least alone, I would think. Hey, I think I got to go get a pair myself now. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of intrigued by those as well. And they have a nice little light up. So if you're a parent, you've always been jealous of your kids light up sparkly shoes. There you go. Now you can have a pair. You know what? I, I'm not a fan of those because my daughter had some sparkly shoes when she was probably two years old. And so like what she would do, whenever your feet would touch something, they'd sparkle and you'd see these red lights. So my daughter would be in her car seat in the back seat making these red lights. And I'd see these red lights in the rearview mirror all the time. I pulled over way too many times just due to my daughter's shoes. <laughs> well, there you go. You made a poor choice of color, sir. Uh, speaking of I think we did. Speaking of interesting choices, we got some good choices going on right now over there on our Twitter account. So if you are following us, and actually pretty much all of our outlets, so if you're following us on the website or if you follow us on Twitter or on Facebook or pretty much wherever uh, you like to, uh, to follow the Options Insider, maybe not on iTunes, you can't really vote on iTunes, you can listen on iTunes, uh, but, but you can't really vote again, vote there, is uh, we're talking about the Options Madness right now. And, of course, if you have been following along, we kind of took the theme of March Madness and kind of made it our own. We thought, what, what, could, what could we do that fit into that bracket of, uh, you know, 16? And uh, pretty much had just about enough brokers to do just that. So we ended up close to the number of exchanges, 14 exchanges, although I, I, uh, I challenge you to vote between ISE and Gemini and Mercury and everything else. Uh, not a lot of nuance there. But for the broker, for the audience, a lot of them have some strong feelings, surprisingly, about different brokers. And so we thought we'd plumb those depths this week. We kicked off options broker madness last week round one is in the books hopefully you had a chance to get your votes recorded and play along if not uh, you're missing out it's really it's really quite fun we've had some interesting i'm not sure you've been following along with uncle mike but uh people have been voting via facebook via our email questions at the options insider.com certainly following along and voting via the twitter poll and retweeting and liking and things like that or 
website comments, our feedback form, pretty much any way you can reach out to us is considered a legitimate vote. And like we say in Chicago here, vote early, vote often, because the more times you vote, the more times you're entered to win fabulous prizes at the end of uh, the thing, even if you don't pick the winner. We're not so concerned about that. We're more concerned about you guys uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, so yeah, last week we had a big shakedown, Uncle Mike. Uh, we had Options House versus Choice Trade. Options House took that one. Uh, an interesting face-off, Trade Station versus Scott Trade. Trade Station took that one, probably no surprise. Scott Trade still kind Kind of uh, nascent in the option space, although they're trying to improve that. Uh, TD Ameritrade uh, coming up versus E Option. They're coming up. Uh, well, as we had uh, OX versus Interactive Brokers last week. Kind of an interesting options oriented face off. Uncle Mike, uh, since you have experience with both, who do you think won the OX versus Interactive Brokers face off? I, I would guess OX. You might think, and no. They did not. They were uh, they really. Were, they were tr- How what was the what was the, uh, what was I'll the, the margin? I'll have to pull out the numbers, but I believe it was close to uh, about a uh, two to one or so for uh, for IB. So uh, I'll have to check the numbers to make sure. I didn't. I didn't. I, I'm not behind the scenes calc. I'm not the. I'm not the accountants at the at the academy behind the scenes uh, calculating all the votes. I just get the numbers at the end. But uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been pretty interesting to watch. We also had Trade King coming along. Versus Lightspeed. The folks at Lightspeed making a good college try of it. Uh, voting everywhere, voting early and often, taking that Chicago mantra to heart, but Trade King triumphing at the end. Uh, Fidelity. Fidelity getting uh, trumped early by Speed Trader, of all things. I thought that was a pretty really? straight, straightforward matchup, and, Fidel- and Speed Trader taking it. I guess Fidelity not feeling the love out there in the options audience. Uh, E-Trade versus Merrill Edge. E-Trade moving on to the second round. And then uh, Sogo Trade versus Charles Schwab. This one also seemed like it might be a bit of a done deal. And who do you think won that one, Uncle Mike? Well, I'm going to go with Sogo Trade in that one. Yeah, because I, uh, I probably led you astray a little bit on that one. But yes, uh, yeah, Sogo Trade. So pretty much both uh, Schwab-oriented brokers uh, shut out in round one. Kind of interesting. So Sogo Trade advances. Uh, so now our face-offs right now are Options House versus Trade Station and E-Trade versus Sogo Trade with the, the later rounds to be announced shortly. They're gonna take, these are going to be a little bit longer because, you know, uh, when you get into the Elite Eight, the, the things take a little bit longer to sort out. So you get a couple of days to vote on these. Uh, but if you haven't played along, listeners uh, by all means make sure you do so go to optionsdecider.com you can vote there uh, you can vote for comments or whatever you can vote for twitter and make sure once you play and vote in the polls you want also want to make sure that you guys get registered to win fabulous prizes we're talking you know kindle fire tablets and some gift cards some cool outlets like amazon and other maybe even a cool uh, options insider prize package people are always asking us to to give out the shirts and things and all the other cool lands and gear that we have here maybe some other cool stuff some bags and some other cool tchotchkes and giveaways we've accumulated accumulated over the years. Throw that in a nice package for one lucky winner. So a lot of cool stuff uh, to give away. So make sure you tweet, you like, you retweet, you know, all that kind of stuff. Favorite. Uh, you tag it on, on Twitter. You vote on email. The more times you vote, the more times you're entered to win. So by all means, check it out. Uncle Mike, I expect you to be doing uh, some, uh, some voting of your own as well. I will do that for sure. <laughs> All right, because it's, it's kind of fun. I like to, it's some way we can apply the March Madness to, uh, to, the, to the show here and, of course, to the uh to the to the network and to the option side as a whole just got a uh, an email from the greasy meatball he is of course running late because what what fun would it be if he was not it's not like we've never done the show before uncle mike right it's not like it's not like we're it's not like this is the first time we're doing the 500 some odd episode of this program <laughs> for him uh, to uh to be running late of course some other interesting names uh that kind of caught our eye from an options perspective this week we got of course a nike coming out uh, tomorrow we'll see how they rock and roll a uh, tesla back to the upside as well back well over the 200 handle 238 Right now, to be precise, closing today up another five, about five and a half bucks, or about a little over two percent today, uh, based on uh, yet another yet another analyst upgrade <laughs> this week. You know, following this stock, and Uncle Mike, I won't do you the disservice of asking you if this is in the strategic Connecticut portfolio because I know it is not. It is far too volatile for uh, the likes of you guys over there, and probably for most sane people. Uh, this name just vacillating all over the place. It set a three hundred thirty-three dollar price target on good old Tesla. So surprise, surprise, was off to the races rallying today, doing about 120,000 contracts, which is about 50% or so uh, north of the typical ADV, right around uh, 80,000 contracts or so. So Tesla always traditionally lighting it up and doing it yet again today. We can probably do a whole show, Uncle Mike. Uh, Tesla. Oh, speaking of which, I'm, I'm burying the lead here. What am I doing? Uh, of course, new iPhone announced today. So I'm curious, uh, the recent move in the stock and the new iPhone, is this is this going to be enough, Uncle Mike? Is this going to this going to move the needle? Are you finally, I know you, you had a little brief flirtation with some with a sampling, a dabbling of some Apple, but is this finally enough? Is the new iPhone going to bring you back into the fold? 
Uh, no, what we did actually is shortly after earnings when Apple got pounded, and I think we got in, uh, I, I got a, a little bit of Apple exposure around like the 93 level, uh, somewhere in the 90s. And so I collared it very tightly, but I think we did, the, and I shouldn't say very tightly, but I, I, coll- I did like a one year 85, 105 collar on Apple and we did get add some exposure to it. Uh, but not a lot. It was just more of the along the lines of the fact that it was just a good company uh, that had dipped a little bit, and it was by no means the Apple mania with which I once was a great part of. Uh, so it was no means with that. I don't. I, I still believe that Apple mania is dead. Uh, but like Hulkamania, it might make a resurgence at some point. But we need innovation first to do it. So a new iPhone, perhaps some new straps for the Apple Watch. Not really moving the needle on the uh, on the innovation factor for you. You know they've set the bar so high for themselves. If their new product doesn't change the world, it's hard to get excited about them. Yeah, it's been an interesting one. You know, when we first started the show, Apple was pretty much all day, all the time. It's kind of sad. It kind of has faded a bit into the background as uh, the Teslas and the Netflix and the others of their ilk seem to have really uh, usurped a lot of the love for a lot of our listeners. But we still we still shine the candle, burn the candle ever so brightly every now and then for good old Apple, hoping they can get back into the fold and get back into the love here on this program. Speaking of this program, it's time for us to keep on rolling. Uncle Mike, uh, you get to do uh, double duty today. You get to join in on the old option block today, too, or the odd block, excuse me, because it's time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody welcome back to the old odd block this is of course the portion of the program where we break down some of the interesting weird unusual somewhat bizarre paper (laughs) that's catching our eye out there in the world of options today got a bit of a funky one to kick things off uncle mike you might find this intriguing uh this might be i'll have to think that this is definitely Certainly in the recent history, the, the longest term paper that we've profiled here on the odd block, uh, certainly this year and probably into last year and the last couple of years, I can't remember going out this far, uh, was going to kick things off in the realm of uh, the iShares Dow Jones U.S. Home Construction and Home Builder ETF, ticker symbol ITB, closing today $26.53, off about, oh, about 1% or so on the day. This is the name that does about 1,500 contracts a day. Doing a whopping about 51,000 <laughs> today. Uh, call the put ratio, Uncle Mike, get ready for this, of about 1,088 to 1. So that should tell you, I think, where the activity was focused <laughs> for, for much of today's uh, session. And, yeah, we're going to turn our attention now not to April, not to, uh, not to May, not to June, not even to Dece or Jan of 2017. No, no, that's way too... Way too close to home for this customer. He, go, he went all the way out to Jan of 2018. Uh, in particular, he was eyeing the Jan 35 2018 calls. So uh, if you're f- playing along there, that's about nearly nine bucks out of the money. And he's getting a little over a year, year plus to do it here. Uh, almost two years here on this trade. So really long term paper. And he didn't do it for some piddly size. No, no. He did it. 51,000 times. He started off, looks like a block of about 40,000 going up for about a buck 25. He bought the rest for around a buck 20. So about split adjusted, came in for right around a buck 24 to gobble up all of these bad boys. Surprise, surprise. No real open interest here on, uh, on this name. Only 50 contracts open on this strike. So clearly opening paper. Didn't see anything else going along with this. Didn't see any stock or anything else going up that would perhaps indicate something else was afoot here. So, Uncle Mike, this one appears to be exactly what it appears to be on the surface. It is a size, upside, out of the money, long-term call buy here. This is kind of the flipping of the coin. We were talking on recent shows a few weeks ago about selling long-term, out-of-the-money premium in some names. This is flipping that script now, buying some long-term premium. 
Uh, so, Uncle Mike, give us your thoughts first on this trade in particular, and then maybe uh, any times, what, what would be a scenario, I'm trying to think of a scenario where I would do this, uh, what would be a scenario where you would be intrigued enough by a name to perhaps go nearly two years out and about 10 handles out of the money? Okay, this is a very intriguing trade. A couple things that I like about it, a couple things that I don't like about it. <clears throat> uh, the things that I don't like about it is the fact that uh, from what it appears, it looks like implied volatility on this specific option is greatly higher than historical volatility. Am I reading this correctly in the show notes? does appear to be that way, sir. All right. So that's kind of one of the ones to where I'm not too keen on. Uh, but here is what I like about this trade is that instead of shelling out $26.52, this comes out to $1.25. So on there, you actually have upside exposure on this stock for only 5% of the risk. Now, with that, it is out of the money. But let's say that you really do, through your analysis, have a very bullish bias towards the Home Builders ETF. Uh, what I really stand neutral on my Home Builders or on my Home Builder sentiment, so I don't have much of an opinion either way for this specific sector of the marketplace. But if you are uberly bullish over the course of the next couple of years, that's not an out of the question style of trade. Now, a couple of things that need to be done in something like this is that if it doesn't move, you do have to be aware that time decay is going to bite you. Here's what I like about the trade, besides the fact that you're only risking around 5% of the underlying, is that you have the ability to get out of this uh, should you so desire. So let's say the stock's maybe at 24 or something like that in a few weeks. You do have the desire to, you have the ability to get out of it at maybe, I don't know, a dollar ten, a dollar five. But now, here's the part that I don't like about it. This is 51,000 contracts. And if you have 51,000 contracts with which you need to get out of, that's going to be a difficult thing to do when, unless you're in something like Apple or SPY or uh, something that's very liquid. So with ITB, I don't know that a 51,000 lot is going to be necessarily an easy thing to where you can just get out of it that easily. So that's the part that I don't like about it. So in terms of when I would get into something like this of just buying an out-of-the-money call, uh, I actually do have a situation with which I would, but I'm going to save that for the strategy block. Oh, you evil, evil tease, you. Right, so, <laughs> so we'll save that as we keep moving on. Got a, a bit of a theme here, Uncle Mike, to uh, today's odd block. It seems like uh, long-term upside love uh, is at least some of the theme. It may change a little bit towards the end, so stay tuned for that, listeners. But as we keep on rolling into our next name, kind of an interesting cross-section of the market today, starting off in the home builders, moving now on to Kraft Heinz, excuse me, company, makers of that delicious cheese and macaroni and all the other fun craft products uh, that your kid probably likes uh, to eat. Closing today, $76.59. Tickers, ticker symbol, excuse me, KHC, off about $0.72 cents or so, nearly 1% on the day. This is the name that does, oh, about 5,000 contracts a day, doing about 5x that, doing about 25,000 uh, contracts, about 20 to 1 calls over the old puts and once again we got to scroll on down the old options chain to find where our trade du jour was located in this this in particular here we're looking again a little bit down the chain a little bit out of the money and a little bit upside in particular it was the jan 2017 so a year closer to home this time the jan 2017 95 call so again about 18 and a half or so handles out of the money here on these paper just loving these as well uh, gobbling up about let's see starting off with about 15,000 for 75 cents and then coming in with about another oh about five or six thousand for about 75 cents as well in different blocks over there on the Philly totaling about 21,000 and change on the day this one uh, only 83 contracts open on this strike so clearly this is all opening Paper digging in a little bit. Don't see the old stock going up or anything else like that. So it's not closing and no stock. So our friend here is clearly feeling the love out here for Crab Tines, and he's giving himself a little bit of room to run to do just that. I mean, looking at this one, uh, this is this is a fair aggressive pulling up a nice little chart here 
of good old craft going back a year. Hey, let's, let's be optimistic. Nah, let's go back about a year. A year's about as far back as we can go on this a little bit longer. And this, this would be, if they hit this 95 handle, 95 and three quarters, actually, <laughs> with these options, uh, then this would certainly be a, a new uh, recent high, uh, certainly a one-year high uh, for uh, KHC. It flirted with about 82 or so back in midsummer. And then it kind of approached those levels again back in uh, the heady days of, uh, of early fall. And then that's kind of about it and a little bit of brief uh, flirtation when the high 70s back in January. Uh, either way, nothing to indicate this thing has uh, but nearly 20 handles of upside uh, left in it. And that's pretty much where he needs to start with this trade because he needs this thing to then take off beyond that for this thing to really start making some money for him. So this one is all sorts of aggressive Uncle Mike and a little bit closer to home, a little bit farther out of the money uh, than our last friend. So similar, similar idea, different execution. What are your thoughts here on our friend buying up all the upside here in KHC? All right, here's my theory on this one. John Kerry is going to appear as a surprise presidential candidate, and because of his ties to Heinz Kraft, that's what's going to get the stock up because he thinks that John Kerry is going to win the win the White House. There you go. Getting political already. We're only about 20-odd minutes into the show, and we're already getting into the political. Bring up Donald Trump next, and we'll be good. All of our listeners will go away. That's pretty much the only thing that I can think of with this trade. <laughs> I know it's a stretch here, but this is one to where I, I don't like this one because of the unless of the – he has some type of analysis or an indicator that shows something that I'm not seeing, but man, that's a lot of movement to happen in a not so long amount of time. So I don't know. I really don't know on this one. So maybe just with the, the John Kerry theory is the best I got with this one, Mark. Yeah, I'd, much, I'd be much happier seeing him buying, uh, taking that same amount of money and perhaps putting it to work smaller size on a more reasonable vertical or something like that that has just any hope of, of, of really making money. Uh, you know, this thing needs a home run before the clock even starts ticking on making money, you know? Uh, so that's, that's never a position you kind of really want to be in. Uh, this, this kind of, uh, you know, that's why we say all the time on the show, size money, not necessarily the smart money. This guy clearly could certainly could know something, could have something else on uh, that is a counterpoint to this. So uh, that is the caveat, as always, with all of this stuff. But that said, uh, you know, when you see someone piling up on this kind of uh, crazy out-of-the-money upside, it kind of reads as someone, Uncle Mike, who uh, just kind of read their first options book, and they're like, oh, I like these things. I want to get along. Let's buy some calls. Where should I do it? Okay, this one. And, uh, you know, we've seen this a lot on the retail side. Never really works out too well. Uh, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll, put, we'll put this one in the to-be-watch category. Maybe, uh, maybe it, will, uh, it will eventually pay off. But this guy, like we said, he needs to knock it out of the park uh, with Kraft Heinz before this trade even starts to make money for him. So um, unless, yeah, unless he has a, a super sharp move in the next couple of weeks and that, that'll certainly work out in his favor. But aside from that, uh, you know, this is, uh, is going to be a difficult one. Uh, to make your money back on. Moving on to our final name of the day. We are really all across the board today, starting off in constru home construction, getting into mac and cheese, and now we're closing off somewhat related here with U.S. Steel. Certainly they make a lot of products that are used in the construction trade. Ticker symbol X, closing today, $15.15. This is the name that does fairly decent volume, even, uh, even to this day, doing about 41, 42,000 contracts a day, lighting up about 58,000 uh, today. This one, Uncle Mike, this will probably get your, uh, get your ears perked up out here. It's not so much a stupid, uh, but it is, I suppose you can call it a bit of a ratio put tree. In particular, we got here, let's scroll on down. This one a little bit closer to home, not all the way out in Jan 2017 or 2018, but out to May, so a little bit nearer term. And uh, what we saw out here, Uncle, uh, Uncle Mike, was uh, some interesting paper. And uh, in particular, it was the May put tree that really caught our eye. If I can, for some reason, my ticker, we go. There we go. The scrolling was slow. We saw a paper putting up the uh, May 13, 11, 10 uh, put tree. It looked like we had it originally pulled up as a ratio, but it's not a ratio. It's straight up 1 to 1 to 1. It looked like it was, it was 10 to 1 at first, which seemed like an odd ratio for a put tree, which is why I was a little cautious about this one, but further digging reveals it was indeed 1 to 1 to 1. Paper coming in, buying 3,000 of the May 13 puts, paying a buck at 39 
As the day went on, they sold another uh, 3,000 of the May 11 puts, so legging into that vertical for 79 cents. And then, not to be outdone, they sold 3,000 more of the May 10 puts, doing those for 59 cents net, doing that spread for a whopping penny. So uh, an interesting one, Uncle Mike. We don't see these types of uh, trees uh, going up uh, very often. Uh, it has a bit of a stupid component to it, this time on the short side. Uh, so an interesting one. Uh, yeah, we ha- I'm trying to think. Last time we talked about a, a tree on the show. Again, it's been some time. So setting a few records here on the Odd Block today for longest term and perhaps uh, uh, first time we talked about a tree in quite some time. So that is interesting in and of itself. Uncle Mike, uh, take us home. Looks like our friend here worrying about some, uh, some downside here. Let's pull up a quick chart going back one year or so on U.S. Steel. And, you know, his uh, fears are not exactly out of place. This thing was trading in the seven handle, so pretty much 50% lower, all near to it, uh, not that long ago, just about a month ago or so. So uh, this recent surge in U.S. Steel, our friend here clearly thinking, not having a lot of really uh, confidence uh, in this name, and if indeed the worst does come to pass, uh, he's not at all uh, too concerned about perhaps picking up some down around that 10 handle again. Uncle Mike, uh, take us home. What's your thoughts here on a rear put tree popping up here in U.S. Steel? You know, this is an interesting trade in that you, for one penny is the cost of the trade. Let's just assume it's even money for to make the concept fairly simple. That means that anything, and this is assuming that we go to our expiration day risk reward graph, uh, which isn't necessarily the case, always the case. But let's just use this for a sake of understanding. Anything below thirteen and between eleven is profit. So if U.S. Steel on this trade alone. Uh, is at $11, then it's $2 of money basically brought in out of thin air. Now, granted, there was risk involved with that, and that risk comes by being short the 10 put. So let's say that it goes down all the way to $10. Uh, If that were to be the case, which is a pretty significant drop percentage-wise in U.S. Steel, then they're still at the maximum profit point. Let's say that it goes down to $9. Well, you're losing a dollar on the $10 put, but remember, you still have that $2 gain on that 1311 put spread, so you have that working in your favor as well. So on there, uh, you're basically looking at something to where anything, the only way that you could lose money on this trade is that is if U.S. Steel is below $8.00, at May expiration. So in other words, you would need, uh, let's see, U.S. Steel right now is at 1509. You would need a 45% drop in the stock for this to be a losing trade. And if th- that were to be the case, then this person would probably say, okay, if it drops that much, I'm happy to own more of it. So overall, I like this trade. And I just think that I don't necessarily have an opinion on U.S. Steel, but conceptually, if you like this company, meaning if you think it's going to come down a little bit, but if it comes down a lot, you're like, heck, I'd buy more at that level. If that's your sentiment, then this tree trade is, I think, a very phenomenally ingenious trade if that's what your sentiment is. If you're just reading an option book saying, ah, buy a few of these, sell a few of these, then it's a dumb trade. But if it's the former, then I think that it's a pretty good spot. Phenomenally ingenious tree trade. I like that. We may have a title for our episode, sir. Phenomenally. You know, Loving you're, it. You're not spearing with the praise today, sir. I like it. And you're right. This is a little bit of a nuance. One of the reasons I wanted to highlight this. We've seen one by twos a million times, you know, buy one, sell two. Not exactly exciting. Uh, you know, that, that accomplishes a similar thing, but a little bit different. Uh, you probably would collect more on that by doing that. This guy is structuring it a little bit differently. Buying one, selling one, and then going a little bit farther down the chain. Seems like he's not exactly uber confident in those levels, choosing the 10 handle instead to write again. Uh, but if that again, if that comes to pass, he gives himself a little bit more cushion by doing that. It uh, doesn't collect as much up front, but if it worse does come to pass, and looking at that chart, that could foreseeably happen very easily out here in U.S. Steel again, uh, then uh, he's a happy camper for a pretty ways down out there. So it's an interesting structure. I, I tend to agree with you on this one. Uh, we like to highlight the interesting ones, and they're not all interesting in the negative way. Listen, Sometimes they're interesting in the, uh, what did you say, phenomenally ingenious 
yes. And you know what? I bet that guy did. He was probably trying to do the trade. He probably had all set up to where I'm going to do this for even money. And he couldn't get filled at even money. He's like, ah, crap. I'll just pay a penny on it. Yeah, you're right. He probably had it all set up in his mind to be uh, even. He's probably like, like, like Andrew. He likes to get his juice for free, and then he has to pay for it. He's probably sitting at home kind of stewing right now saying, I had, I had to pay for my juice on this one. I don't like that at all. I could lose a penny. <laughs> I can lose a penny 3,000 times and I'm not okay with that All I right. bet he is <laughs> Alright, interesting stuff You guys can always uh, follow us on Twitter To get the alerts as we're putting them out Or go ahead, surf on over to theoptionsdecided.com Or Facebook or wherever you like to get our content And we put out alerts there throughout the day too So you want to get a little bit more detail on these Or other alerts or perhaps find some other stuff uh, We're writing about over there Interesting stuff that's catching our eye in the world of options By all means, uh, surf on over and do just that Meanwhile, it's Monday it's time for, this is usually Uncle Mike's been taking a break all this time, and now he gets to come back in. I'm working him hard this episode, listeners. A little bit of double duty, because it's time for the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right, listeners, welcome to uh, the strategy block. This is indeed the portion of the show where Uncle Mike takes the reins and gives us a bit of options, education, wit, wisdom, and analysis. But before we do that, we are joined better late than never by the greasy meatball himself, Mr. Mark Sebastian. Mark, before we dive into the strat block, why don't you go ahead and first off, welcome to the program, better late than never. And secondly, uh, what's been catching your eye in today's activity, sir? Well, I would say that, uh, one, the VIX is now closed with a 13 handle. Uh, shocking. Uh, oil vol, uh, I mean, just an absolute v- v- volcopolypse, volpocalypse, if you will, uh, kind of across the board. Um, I mean, less than a month ago, the VIX was 23, not 13. Uh, that's just been an incredible move. Uh, lots of kind of long-term call buying was one of the themes I saw today. I think uh, I, I wrote up the uh, the odd block today. You probably noticed based on the grammar. Um, but uh, the... Uh, just tons of long-term buying. Most notably, I was surprised by uh, the home builders. That that long some that long-term call was in in kind of a, a trades by appointment uh, ETF. Uh, ETF. Um, you know that was just phenomenal. Uh, the other piece bonds kind of taken on the chin today. So it's uh, it feels like the market's normalizing some. That was that was my big feel on the day, and. Uh, Kind of what I'm be watching for over the next couple of days, uh, you know, I feel like they've priced out the Easter holiday that we're going to get off here. How much, how much more can VIX get below that level? I think is the big question. Yeah, you're right, and of course, certainly we just finished the odd block, and you're right, there was a nice, uh, interesting thematic uh, narrative to that one of a lot of long-term call of across the board, pretty much, except for that one. What Uncle Mike call it? Phenomenally ingenious put tree. Uh, he really liked that one. So he may be, look, stay tuned for some put trees coming to the Strategic Night portfolio soon, listeners. <laughs> Speaking of Uncle Mike, Uncle Mike, you've been uh, waiting patiently there. It is Monday. It is strategery time. What do you got cooking for us here in the strategy block today? Out of the money call buying, as a matter of fact. Wow, there you go. About three years out. Does that sound about right? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, what I wanted to go through today in the spirit of the odd block, I feel awe-inspired to discuss uh, when would be a time with which to buy out-of-the-money call options in some way, shape, or form. And so I think that if you have a lower volatility environment, then that would be a time with which you would want to be more of a premium buyer. Now, the first thing that I want to clarify is that we are at the lower end of a range right now with the VIX, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the VIX is low. Everyone can have an opinion on it. The VIX could be at six tomorrow. Who knows? And if that's the case, then the VIX is very high right now. But historically speaking, the VIX is lower compared to where it was uh, a few weeks ago. So with that being said, the first thing that I would look for if I ever wanted to buy an out-of-the-money call option one year out or something along those lines would be to have uh, lower volatility. Now, if there were higher volatility, it doesn't necessarily mean I wouldn't do it, but I would try and spread it off in some way, shape, or form with a diagonal spread, a vertical spread, or uh, whatever tool would work best for the current situation. 
So let's say that I'm looking at XYZ stock, and XYZ stock is at uh, 35. Let's look at that home builders trade that we talked about today in terms of let's kind of dissect that a little more. Uh, I would not do that trade personally, even if I was bullish on the home builders. Uh, the reason is, is that in my opinion, uh, volatility would be too high for my taste in, in such a thing. Uh, when you have the um, higher volatility, then you have something to where, and this is just based on the numbers that came out today. I'm assuming that volatility is higher uh, on this. I have not analyzed volatility on the home builders by any means, but if based on the notes, if volatility is higher then that, I would not do it. But uh, with that being said, let's say that I felt that implied volatility was rather low and I was really just uberly bullish on the home builders for whatever reason, uh, because of my analysis that there has just been so many people, so many building permits that are being issued because of the fact that uh, there's just so many tools being bought. And just everybody thinks that the, that the home builders are going to just be going through the roof. And combine the fact that those out of the money calls have a relatively low implied volatility. If I had those indicators, I would have no qualms whatsoever about buying some type of higher, or I'm sorry, about buying some type of out of the money call option. So then at that, st at that point, when do you get out of it? Uh, well, you can get out of it in a few ways. Let's say that the stock were to go a little bit higher and at some stage, those far out of the money call options that you paid a buck 25 for become $2.50. Then at that stage, what I would likely do would be to sell half of them. And then it's basically one to where you're trading on the house's money, for lack of a better term. Now, the other time with which you need to get out of them is when it starts going against you. At what point does it start going against you from the standpoint of time decay as well as price? I'd have a line in the stand established to where if we were to come down $1, $2, whatever the case may be, then obviously the trade's not working the way with which I had hoped and the trade is broken. So in a broken trade, it's time to get out. The second way with which I would get out is let's say the stock doesn't move within one month, two months, three months, whatever time frame that I established from the beginning, at that stage, I would get out of it because of the fact that time value is going to start to work against me. So when doing or when buying an out-of-the-money call option, those are two of the main factors with which you need to have in mind beforehand is when do you get out based upon the underlying not going your way. And the second thing is when do you get out based upon uh, time value not working for or working against you too quickly. In terms of volatility, hopefully vol doesn't work against you that much because hopefully you did buy. You were correct in your volatility judgment that vol was low. But if volatility does go against you, you need to respect that as well. And even though it hopefully is not as much of a factor for you because vol was already low enough already, you need to have that in mind as well as to when you would get out of it. So when would I buy an out-of-the-money call option two years out like this trade was? Uh those all of those stars would specifically have to be aligned, but if they were, I would consider it. And that's the strategy block for today. All right. Thank you there, Uncle Mike. And of course, now it's time for us to keep on rolling. We got a little bit of time so we could squeeze in a little bit extra special mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Mail Block. Like the name implies, this is indeed the portion of the program where you guys get to take the reins and break down a little bit of uh, interesting <laughs> shall we say, uh, questions, comments, share them with us as well as with your fellow uh, Options Insider Radio Network listeners. And, of course, you can always hit us up via all the usual platforms that I mentioned at the top of the show, Twitter, Facebook, Stock Twits, our website, wherever you like to leave stuff, even in the old iTunes store uh, where, um, where we, of course, we have a lot of good comments. So if you don't check those as often, see if you have a timely question, get it in via those other platforms. Uh, but otherwise, we could still uh, we could still get checking out some stuff. Speaking of questions, uh, we've got uh, a bunch cooking here. Uh, let's see how many we can get to today. By the way, let me say, uh, uh, Jeremy from NASA 
there, who, uh, with your epic treatise of an email, uh, we'll need like half a show to get to that one. So we read it, we saw it, we're not ignoring you, but uh, I don't think we have time on the show to answer your, your myriad questions, let alone discuss uh, the numerous research papers you cite in your email. So thank you for your uh, in-depth email, but we need to save a little bit more time <laughs> for that one uh, on a future episode. Instead, we'll move into some quick ones. Uh, let's see here. Here's a good quick one. This one comes from Gruce. Uh, this one, he says, hey, uh, regarding euro dollar futures options, are there different quirks uh, between the months? People are writing in about euro dollars recently. I'm not sure why euro dollars are on, on everyone's minds uh, of late versus pretty much being non-existent over the past other nine years <laughs> on this network. Uh, of course, there have been a little bit, a little bit of play in the world of rates of late, so that probably has something to do with it. Uh, but in general, that's a product that I always uh, watched with a lot of interest. I was over there at CME a number of times looking at that pit back in the heady days of it when it was rocking and rolling. That was the place to be. I remember talking to the CME guys very early on about the nuances of that product and really how difficult it was going to be. They didn't think it was really going to be able to port that to Globex in any sort of appreciable form, and they managed to do it. Obviously, it trades a decent number, decent amount of paper upstairs now, so uh, they managed to conquer that issue. Uh, so there are a lot of, of different nuances out there. That said, I never really traded it myself, uh, so I never really sat down and said, okay, uh, you know, front month versus third month how does this trade in between itself so i never really had any exposure out that mark i'm guessing you didn't spend any time uh, in the euro dollars pits out there in your in your SIBO. you never really spent any time at the at the at the mark did you well not a little bit and and you know a guy told today was that uh, that i do know that that trade a bunch in euro dollars said that you know trading euro dollar futures options is a lot tra- like trading vix options uh the way the months all spread off each other where they're tied where they're related but not tied um you know and that's kind of one of the big pieces is that uh because interest rate expectations are different for different periods of time spreading is different just like vix you know volatility expectations are different for periods of time so that was the big difference that that i was told relative to standard equities is that you have to be aware that with interest rate options the events that are are over certain periods of time the interest the way expectations are changing in interest rates is is really one of the the major keys to be aware of when when trading these things uh yeah you know it's interesting one like we said on the show many times in the past we're not really your home for all things fixed income options trading uh maybe we'll add one of those to the network down the road if more of you are interested and you know for a long time rates just wasn't a complex that had anything interesting going on, uh, that's changed over the course of the past year. So maybe we'll revisit that stance. Uh, we used to always give the Viceroy a hard time when he would bring up rates here on the show and any sort of rates-oriented product. But again, uh, that space, that sector, uh, getting uh, a little bit more action, a little bit more love. Speaking of love, we've been getting some love in a variety of different capacities. So we like to like to highlight a little bit every now and then, uh, particularly from Facebook. For whatever reason, a lot of you guys like to use Twitter and email and other things. A lot, a lot of you guys like to like to like to provide feedback on facebook but of course we, we welcome it there as well including i'm going to butcher this guy's name so i apologize in advance trong hai nguyen wrong trong hai wen uh, i believe i got that right i don't know let me know if i, if I butchered it. i'm sure i did uh here i'd say hello options insider big fan of all your work listen to your shows all the time well thank you for that uh, you're at many many option blocks ago he puts in parentheses around the viceroy's last show before he left May have been his last show, in fact. This guy's been a, a long-time listener. Good for him. Uh, he mentioned a past show where the Rock Lobster discussed how to trade a butterfly at expiration, and Alex thought it was pure gold. I don't recall what type of butterfly trade it was, i.e. standard, iron, or broken wing, uh, but Alex seemed impressed by Andrew's explanation. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to locate which episode this was Excuse me, this was aired on. Any chance you can find it out? And let me know. Love your work. When it comes to Options Insider, I go long. Cheers. Well, thank you for all that love. You're just overflowing with love here on on the mail. Uh, I do recall Alex gushing about that episode. I don't recall the episode as a whole myself. I'm not sure. I think one of the things when you're hosting these shows, you got a myriad of other things going on in the background sometimes during the conversations that tend to call my attention away. So I'm not always, I can't always pay 100% attention to everything that's being discussed at every given moment. Uh, so this one may be maybe one of those that fell into the cracks. Obviously, the Rock Lobster isn't here to explain it himself. Mr. Greasy Meatball, the other half of the Option Pit team there, uh, do you recall what exactly, what type of butterfly he was talking about there? you have any recollection of this? 
No idea. Maybe a one by three by two. I have no clue. I, I, we'll have to ask him next time. I he doesn't have a standard go to type of. He's flight. on with a client right now, so <laughs> I, he's I know, uh, I know he's tied like, up. I know you like the broken wing flies. Is he a broken wing? I'm fly a big guy broken well? wing fan, but the one by three by two is kind of a little different spin on a broken wing. Um, it's uh, the the margining is changed. Its vague exposure is changed. Uh, but uh, yeah, all, all those are. You know, th- that might have been what he was playing with. Uncle Mike, I'm sure you don't recall what uh, what he's referring to here. I remember the episode, and I remember him liking it. And I remember liking it myself, but I can't remember exactly what it was, unfortunately. Clearly it made an impression on all of our listeners, but not on us whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have to go so. dig that up in the, uh, in the archives and see if we can. We'll find out what episode that is for you uh, there, Mr. Wynn, and get it out to you. And for everyone else, too, we are except going to be launching that uh, – that best of feed sometime in the near future. So maybe that'll be a good one to put in there. Hey, if it's good enough for uh, the Viceroy and for a lot of you guys out there, it's good enough for us. And maybe clearly we all here need a refresher on it as well, because it clearly went, uh, went over all of our heads. We were all doing a bunch of other things. All right. One more here. We got time for a quick comment. This comes from Joseph, Joseph. Let's just go with Joseph. A. A lot of epic names on the show today. Good morning, Options Insiders. I wanted to stop by and say thank you for providing me and many others with a free source of invaluable knowledge. Wow, well, you're welcome, sir. I hope you don't mind, but I shared your page with a couple of trading groups that I am a member of. Thanks hap- again. Happy trading. Well, thank you, Joseph, for the love. And yeah, we don't mind if you guys share our stuff. So we put it up, we put it out there for all of you guys to enjoy and then to share with your friends. So if you have something you like or even something you don't like, feel free to share it and put it out there far and wide. Uh, the more, the merrier. And of course, that also includes you guys uh, streaming also via the chat room now. So if you guys want to stream via MixLR, you guys could probably send in some votes for the options madness that way as well. Uh, a lot of you have to have a Mixler account to do that. But if you want to get us that way, too, we'll add that to the mix as well. How about that? Pun intended. So if you guys want to get at us via Mixler as well, we'll add that to the mix. We'll count those votes those votes for the options of madness. So you guys, you too, can be entered into the prize. Or if you already voted the other ways, you can add another leg to your trade on trying to get at some of those awesome prizes, including a uh, free all-expenses-paid trip to Mark Sebastian's house where you can have a beer with him. It'll be uh, really fun. It's worth about a buck seventy-five plus the train ticket, so it's a good price. All right, moving on. <laughs> Getting up in the show. We've got to keep on rolling to our final segment. It's time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for... Around the Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block. Like the name implies, this is where we tell you about what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this week. We already mentioned the top of the show. It is a truncated holiday week, so bear that in mind with all of your trading. If you're seeing, hey, it looks like this is uh, perhaps a uh, an interesting deal on Thursday afternoon, there's a reason behind it. So, so pay attention to that. We did mention uh, Nike is popping off tomorrow. So if you are so inclined that that nearly $4 straddle does intrigue you, it's one of the few names left to really uh, catch your eye in this in the dregs here, the tail end of the earnings season. Got Krispy Kreme coming out as well. Good old Kosi. I haven't talked about that one in a long time. Not exactly the richest name on the board. But that one's also coming out later this week after the bell on Thursday. And surprise, surprise, nothing on Friday. That said, we turn now our attention to uh, the hinterlands of St. Charles. Uncle Mike, what's catching your eye for the week to come? Not a lot, but what I am looking at is 205.54 and SPY. That was the the op- that was the close of 2014. 2015, well, not a lot happened from start air in terms of uh, open to close, but uh, looking to see if we can get over that and see if we can become uh, more po- or, or get over that next hurdle uh, in the S and P 500. After that, 213.78 would be the all-time high in SPY, and seeing if we can do that. But for now, uh, we got the next hurdle that we have to get over. All right, keeping an eye on that. And Mr. Greasy Meatball, what's catching your eye to the week to come, sir? You know, where is the VIX going to go, and where are uh, where are the levels? Uh, are we off to the races, or? Do we get a bit of a pause? Uh, I, I think the key is, uh, has the market fully priced out the long weekend? Because uh, if that's the case, VIX may just kind of creep itself higher, and um, we may get a little bit of a back off. My personal feeling is, uh, I think that you gotta. We got. I feel like we're gonna drop one to one and a half percent 
uh, over the next couple of days, uh, maybe by Thursday. It's given a little bit, a little market taking a breather. You know, we've had five run, five big up weeks in a row. Uh, I'd like to see a small down week before we uh, we take another big breath higher. Uh, other other stuff I'm watching is some of these retailers. Nike has earnings this week just off to the races today. Uh, a lot of the earnings names are are running. And uh, the other piece, Transpose. Take a look at Transpose. They are uh, they are crushing it. They are running really high. Uh, and then my final kind of observation that I'm be watching, XLP. Now, what is XLP? That is Consumer Staples. Your Procter and Gamble, Gambles of the world. Your J and Js. Um, that volatility, in particular, relative to every other ETN, is back to uh, low levels, not of 2015, but low levels of 2014. Those type of levels. So it's it's interesting to see where the vol is coming out because it's not coming out of things like uh, the pharmaceutical ETF. All right, buddy. That music means it's time to bring to a close this episode of the option. But before we go, as always, let me check back in one last time with my cohorts, my partners in crime here on the old all-star panel. See what they have cooking. That may interest you. Starting off in the land of the meatball, all things greasy. Mr. Greasy Meatball, what's cooking in the land of the pit? And by the way, you know why Nike's running today, of course, because they have self-lacing shoes. That's, that's got to be worth at least two handles, right? There you go. Uh, lovely. Yeah, no, we've got uh, a webinar on Wednesday. Watch your emails for that. Uh, we've got our calendar webinar. Got a, a calendar Saturday class starting uh, April 2nd. Go to optionp.com slash calendar. Use code 25 underscore OFF, all capitals, to take advantage of uh, 25 bucks off for Options Insider uh, listeners. Same question for you, Uncle Mike Tussaw. What is cooking in the land of RCM Wealth Advisors and indeed going long? Our, uh, yeah, IRA season is upon us. Call me if you are interested in knowing your contribution limits, your rules, potential strategy, 312-212-3531, or send me an email at m2saw at rcmfs.com. All right, listeners, you heard him. By all means, if you want to hit him up for an RIA, head on over to RCM Wealth Advisors and do just that. Now, on behalf of Uncle Mike and the Greasy Meatball, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing, sending in such great questions, and of course, for tuning in live. We'd love to have you guys there in the chat room, the raucous crew there in the chat room with your questions, your comments, your your pearls of wisdom. If you're not doing that yet, mixlr.com. Surf on over to the website, follow us via the link we put out there on Twitter or other episode or other outlets, Facebook, etc. Our website, and of course, you can just grab the app on your device of choice and stream along live. It's really fun on Thursday when we get to uh, some listener, a lot more listener mail on that show. So you guys get to chime in with some live questions on that one, which is pretty fun. So by all means, tune in Thursdays at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Of course, we'll have to see you Monday, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern as well. Make sure no no ball views this week on Friday. We are off that day. So sadly, no live stream. And of course, I mentioned at the top of the show, I'll mention it again. If you're not doing so, by all means, join in the fun that is our options broker madness. You can play along twitter.com slash options or via our Facebook website or anywhere else. We pretty much have content. Send us an email, questions at the options Use our feedback form anywhere you want to vote, anywhere you want to make your voice heard. That will count for you in uh, the grand prize pool at the end when all is said and done you don't have to pick the winners we're making it easy for you we just want you guys to play along and make your voices heard and hey make the brokers know about your voices as well there have been some interesting upsets so far so if you guys want to participate in that battle royale then by all means do so easiest way is via twitter but you can do it pretty much anywhere we post our content so we'll see you guys next time for more of the option block
preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 